Hi. Today we'll be reading one of the stories from a book called Bespelling Jane Austen. It is a collection of Jane Austen stories retold to include supernatural elements and things like that. It is done by a collection of authors. Today's will be Blood and Prejudice, written by Susan Crenard. Chapter 1. Present Day, New Haven, Connecticut. It is a truth universally acknowledged that every decent straight guy who isn't dead broke is in want of a good woman. As my dear Grandpa Bennett used to say, bullshit. I should know. Not that I've been looking, mind you. My two younger sisters make up for the rest of us ten times over. But Jane, why no one has snapped her up yet, is incomprehensible. Of course, no ordinary guy would deserve her. Not my sweet, adorable Jane. I was thinking about the perfect husband for my big sister when the family gathered for Dad's annual office birthday party at Bennett Laboratories. Dad, BL's president and founder, Jane, head of personnel, and Mary, assistant accountant, were already at the office. Mom had come in from my parents' house at Brainford, Kitty and Lydia from their closet in Manhattan, and I put up my out-to-lunch sign at Longburn Books and walked the six blocks to BL's modest headquarters and research facility. Not that I'd lose many customers. Dad said it was only my natural stubbornness that kept me firmly planted in the struggling independent bookstore business, the same way he kept fighting to preserve some small bit of pride as he watched Bennett Laboratories facing a complete takeover by a company that didn't give a damn about what he'd accomplished. But I was thinking about Jane that early afternoon, wondering what would happen to her if BL went under. Not that she couldn't find another job, at least so long as she stuck up for herself a little. Of course I was worried about Dad and Mom and Mary, too. I couldn't imagine a world without BL. My world, at least. It had been at the center of my family for almost as long as I could remember. If Dad hadn't been so reckless with investments, or if he hadn't taken too many risks in his eternal quest for new discoveries. <sighs> I tried to put BL's problems out of my mind as I took the stairs to the second floor. The employees were standing around in nervous groups, trying to appear cheerful for Dad's sake. Jane was beaming at everyone. Even if we were nervous, she wouldn't show it. She'd put up balloons and streamers and had laid out a feast of finger food, sandwiches, and drinks. Mary looked like she'd much rather be at her desk, buried in her accountant books, though that could, couldn't be a very pleasant job these days. As for Mom, she was chattering at an unfortunate lab tech who had wandered a little too close to her web. His face collapsed in pathetic gratitude when Mom saw me. Lizzie! She held out her hands, grabbed mine, and kissed me noisily on the cheek. Have you heard? Mr. Bingley is coming. I was so surprised by her announcement that I was momentarily speechless. Mom didn't waste time filling in the silence. Can you imagine? She went on in a tone made of one part indignation and two part satisfaction. Your father invited him. Mr. Bennett said that we should show that you're not worried about the acquisition. He's right, I said, though my thoughts were anything but calm. So much of this depends on how you play the game. Putting up a confident front is, I know that very well, Lizzie, she said irritably. She leaned closer as if the whole room couldn't already hear her. I haven't met Mr. Bingley. You know how your father refuses to tell me anything that's going on here but I've been told that he's a very handsome man and extraordinarily rich. Trust mom to think that was the most important thing, not the fact that BL was on the verge of going under. What does that have to do with anything, mom? I asked. It must be obvious even to you, Lizzie. I'm counting on him marrying one of you girls. Then, if Mr. Bingley does take over, we won't have anything to worry about. I'd been annoyed at Mom plenty of times in my life, but I'd learned how to hide it at a very young age. Who did you have in mind? I asked dryly. Well, Jane is the eldest, and she really ought to have first shot. Did I hear my name? Jane said, coming in to join us. She smiled at Mom and at me with an unfeigned warmth that I'd never been able to match. You've heard that Mr. Bingley is coming to the party? Mom asked. No, I didn't, but... It seems like a good idea. Why? I asked bluntly. Well, he only inherited BP a few months ago. 
He's never attended the negotiations himself, but I've heard good things about him. I'm sure he'll want to reconsider some of his representatives' more stringent demands when he really knows us. I shook my head. Your faith in people never ceases to amaze me, Jane. Oh, Isba, she said, using the nickname she'd given me when I was a baby. You only have to look a little harder. The good is always there. How right you are, darling, Mom said. I'm sure Mr. Bingley will be perfectly charming. I rolled my eyes. Where's Dad? Jane's forehead wrinkled. He had some last-minute call. I don't think it was good news. Is it ever? I thought. But I smiled and squeezed her hand. This is supposed to be a celebration, remember? She brightened. No one could keep Jane down for long. Yes, everything is ready. I have the champagne on ice, and... The absolute quiet in the room was so sudden that Jane stopped mid-sentence. Mom turned around. Everyone was staring towards the door to the hallway as two men walked in, and I knew that Mr. Bingley had arrived. Handsome. Okay, I'd give him that. Though he wasn't my type. Blonde, blue-eyed, average height, and smiling in a way that seemed almost as sincere as Jane on one of her happy binges. His suit was a little rumpled, as if he didn't much care if he looked like the extremely rich president of a major pharmaceutical company. He held my attention for about five seconds before his friend stalked in. Now, <laughs> I'm not the girly type. I don't fall all over myself when a good-looking guy looks my way. But this time I held my breath and just stared. Tall, dark, and handsome. Check, check, and check. He moved like a dancer, or maybe just a guy who was used to being noticed wherever he went. His athletic build and broad shoulders were admirably displayed in his impeccable custom-made suit, as faultlessly pressed as Bingley's was rumpled. There was something else about him. Something dangerous. It radiated from him, casting everyone and everything else in shadow. When he glanced in my direction, I saw more than arrogance and self-insurance in his eyes. There was a glint to them that reminded me of a wolf strolling into a pen full of fat sheep. Mom rushed over to Bingley in his looming shadow with a grin that would have frightened any man with brains. Mr. Bingley, how very delightful! Jane slid up next to me. I didn't expect Mr. Bingley to be so... She trailed off in bitter lip, but I noticed that her eyes were very bright. I mean, doesn't he look like a nice person? My poor, naive Jane. He did look nice, our Mr. Bingley. Just the kind of guy who'd let others do his dirty work so he could maintain his facade of niceness. But maybe Jane was right. She often was. And if I had to pick the guy most likely to eliminate the com competition by throwing them out of a life raft with a slow leak in it, it would be Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome. Who's the guy with Bingley? I asked Jane. Oh, that must be Mr. Darcy. He's on the Bingley Pharmaceutical Board of Directors. Figured. He looks like Bingley's bodyguard. I've heard they're good friends. Well, I thought, they do say opposites attract. I was about to reflect further on the subject when Dad came into the room. He looked a little like a mad scientist with his wisps of white hair sticking out at all angles and his preoccupied air. Like Mary, he'd have rather been back at his desk than partying, and I couldn't believe he was thrilled about Bingley being there, even if he felt the need to invite him. Dad greeted Bingley and Darcy with a smile and outstretched hand, introducing them to the other employees and to Kitty and Lydia, who had joined Mom in a froth of giggles and flirtatious glances. I stood well out of the way, watching Jane gravitate ever nearer to Bingley, while Darcy hovered behind his friend, treating everyone who came within spitting distance to a sneer worthy of Edward G. Robinson. Maybe they're gay, I thought. That would certainly throw a wrench in Mom's plans. But Bingley seemed to ignore Darcy completely, greeting everyone with the kind of friendliness that was hard to fake. He came to a dead stop when Dad introduced Jane. He looked at her, and she looked at him, a pair of angels heading for a fall. Now, I've never believed in love at first sight. It makes for good movies and bad novels, but it really comes down to sex, and Jane just wasn't that kind of girl. I decided I'd spent enough time watching. I grabbed a couple of champagnes served up in fancy plastic flutes and joined them. 
Lizzie turned to me with the most radiant smile I'd ever seen. Lizzie, she said. Mr. Bingley, Mr. Darcy, this is my sister Elizabeth. I raised one flute in salute. Nice to meet you, I lied. Care for some champagne? Bingley grinned, showing a mouthful of gleaming, gleaming white teeth. Thank you, Mrs. Bennet, he said in a pleasant tenor. I think I will, but please, call me Charles. Charles, I glanced at the formidable Mr. Darcy. Would you like one, Mr. Darcy? For the first time, our eyes met, and it was like walking to a metaphor describing brick walls and immovable objects. I'd taken a step back before I even realized it, and the champagne sloshed over my blouse. Darcy didn't seem to notice. He was staring at me with his piercing indigo eyes as if we were the only two people in the room and he was about to eat me for lunch. The picture that idea put into my mind made me feel... Well, let's just say it had been a while since I had quite that reaction on meeting a guy for the first time, and I couldn't figure out what the hell was wrong with me. I'd met other tall, handsome guys before, but not like him. I wanted to run screaming out of the room. Instead, I tipped back the plastic flute and drank the remaining champagne in one swallow, then promptly fell into a fit of coughing. Two seconds later, Charles was pounding me on the back, while Jane's face swam in front of me like an old VCR tape copied one too many times. Lizzie? Are you all right? I straightened, blinking back tears in my eyes. <laughs> Completely! Except I could still feel Darcy's eyes skewering me haughty and contemptuous. How clumsy of me, I said with a sharp smile. You should have taken the champagne, Mr. Darcy. I don't care for any. Thank you. His voice was crisp, formal, and very English. My heart started to flutter like Mar Marilyn Monroe's white dress in the seven-year itch. I think I'd better clean up, I said, pushing the empty flute into Jane's hand. Excuse me. I rushed out and ducked into the bathroom, as rattled as if I'd just woken up from one of those dreams where you're walking around your old high school in your underwear. I skidded to a stop in front of the mirror and leaned over the sink. Lydia used to tease me about not caring how I looked. For her, looks are everything. For me, not so much. But now I was thinking of Darcy staring at me, and I noticed that my hair was curling in all the wrong places. I had dark circles under my eyes from staying up late reading the newest Sue Grafton, and the subtle lipstick I'd put on was smeared. I hit the sink with my fist and instantly regretted it. I shook my hand until it stopped buzzing, combed my hair with my fingers, repaired my lipstick, and examined my blouse. No help there unless I ran back to the store and grabbed a t-shirt. To hell with Darcy. I didn't give a damn what he thought. Did I? In spite of my determination to pretend I hadn't made a fool of myself, I hesitated outside the door to the meeting room. I could hear two men talking very quietly just inside and immediately recognized the voice of my nemesis. You know how I detest such gatherings, Bingley, he said. I have no interest in the affairs of this company's employees, least of all those of her family. You can be such a jerk sometimes, Darcy, Bingley said. You didn't exactly refuse when I asked you to come. And anyways, these people should have your sympathy. Bingley Pharmaceuticals belongs to you, I believe. And I should have been paying more attention to how it was being run. You have carried on your father's work in seeking cures for obscure diseases that no other company will touch, Darcy said. You need feel no qualms about acquiring a business that is on the verge of collapse. Your business advice is usually sound, but in this case, if you wish to succeed in the work you support, you cannot be sentimental in such matters. I know how much you want Bingley Laboratories, Darcy, but this isn't the place for one of your lectures. He cleared his throat. What do you think about her? To whom are you referring? Didn't you see her? She's so beautiful. Tolerable. What do you mean, tolerable? All that beautiful blonde hair? Ah, I fear I misunderstood. You refer to the elder sister. Of course. What did you think I... <laughs> oh, I get it. You thought I meant Elizabeth. I should have known she'd be more your type. Hardly. Unlike you, Charles, I am more particular in my choices. You can scarcely expect me to be engaged by a woman incapable of drinking a simple glass of champagne.